this morning, um, as you can see, the title of my message is, is behind me, which is uh, Fear Right or Fear Wrong. And uh, so today we're going to, I want to kind of take you on a journey on there's, there's a right way to fear and there's a wrong way to fear. Um, and we're going to look at what the source of that fear is, an example of it, how to overcome it, and what it what it'll look like when, when you do, when you are free. Uh, so, how many of you have a phobia, or how many of you are scared, scared of something? Almost everybody, right? And so, pho- phobia is just derived from the Greek word phobos, and uh, you just put phobia on the end of whatever you're scared of, and, and it's a condition, I guess. Uh, <laughs> But it's funny, uh, about a year, last summer I got the opportunity to pre- preach at uh, Rogers Bay and I preached a message on Gideon and, and if you know the story of Gideon, he was a pretty timid, scared fella. And uh, so I was listing out some fears and uh, for example, arachnophobia is the, is the fear of spiders or necrophobia is the fear of death, uh, ophidiophobia is the fear of snakes and uh Coincidentally, at this same time last year, me and my wife had just bought a house, and the day after we bought it, there was a, a black snake uh, in front of the garage. Um, and I took a picture of it and sent it to my mom, and because uh, she has a phidiophobia. That, that would probably be, I, I would dare to say her first or, or second top fear. And anyway, she te- I text a picture of her to her being mean. She texts texted me back and said, you might as well go on sale that house because I ain't coming. <laughs> uh, and that, you know, thinking about fear, it made me think about that message last year. But uh, before we get into it, I'm going to pray, all right? Dear Lord, thank you for, for another beautiful, amazing day. Thank you for everybody in this room. I just pray that uh, you help us to see and hear with our hard eyes. Uh, and I just pray that you'll say whatever you want to say and, and just get me out of the way. I love you in your name. So, what is the source of fear? Uh, for me, 1 John 4, 18 is, is kind of the, the foundation to this whole thing. Um, and I'm going to start there. So, 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. So if you look at that, it says, instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So for me, punishment would be the source of fear, right? You, you are torment or punishment. Some translations say torment um, is the source of your fear. You are afraid of being rejected, you're afraid of failing, you're afraid of whatever. And, and so how this translates, and you're afraid because you're not perfected in love. And, and what, is, what does God say? God is the only one who is perfect in love, right? And love, there's no fear in love, right? So how would this, to help better explain myself how would this translate in your life maybe in your marriage uh you're afraid that you're gonna your wife's gonna let you down so you fear that your wife may not make you happy because you're putting your trust or faith in your wife and and the reason i know that is because i experienced that firsthand and a lot of times i look for happiness in my wife and so I was building her up and putting all this pressure on her that she was not made, people were not made to fulfill that kind of love, only God is. And, and like Pastor Bobby said last week, when you turn a good thing into a God thing, it, it, it becomes a bad thing. So it's not necessarily bad that you want your wife to be happy, but when you look for your happiness in her, she's always going to let you down. Because God is, is, is the true source of, of your happiness. So you fear that she's going to let you down, and so you're, you, and you get anxiety, right? And anxiety is just another form of fear. Another, maybe, maybe it translates for you financially. Maybe you put all your faith, hope, and trust in your job or your career, 
And, and maybe as a husband, you fear that you're going to fail. You're not going to be able to, you're not going to be the provider of your household or the leader of your household or, or that you're going to lose your job or that you're not going to make enough money. Whatever it is in your life, you fear something. And that is because you're putting your faith, hope, and trust into a, a thing into, instead of God. Um, and if you notice in 1 John 4, 18, it says there's no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear. So I said that to say this. How do, the second thing I want to point out is how do you become perfected in love? Well, if you back up to 1 John 4, 13 through 17, it tells you. Verse 13 says, This is how we know that we remain in Him and He in us. He has given us He has given us of His Spirit. He has given us His Spirit. The Holy Spirit is walking in the Spirit. Being in the Spirit is, is a way you become perfected in love. Verse 14, And when we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent His Son as the world's Savior, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God and remains in Him and He in God, you, you have to proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. Verse, that was verse 15. And we have come to know and believe that the love God has for us. God is love and the one who remains in love remains in God and God remains in Him. You have to know how much God loves you. And you have to put your trust in that. Not in your marriage or your wife or your job or your things. If you imagine how God's how big God is and, and how He created the earth and galaxies and millions and billions of miles of matter and space, that same bigness of God, I don't even know if that's a word, but that's the only way I know how to express it. That same massiveness is, is how much He loves you. And if when you start to put your trust in that, verse 17, in this, love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as He is, so also are we in this world. And if you look at verse 19, we love because He first loved us. So, now that we've looked at kind of how to become perfected in love, what does it look like? What is an ex For me, children are an example of this. And if you look at Matthew 18, 3 and 4, uh, the disciples had come up to Jesus and they asked Him, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus calls a child up among them. And in verse 3, He says, Truly I tell you, He said, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. If you think about it, children don't have any fear. They don't have any pride. They don't have any jealousy. They put their... And if you think about when, when you were a child, if you can think that far back, that when you believed everything your mom and daddy said, right? They were almost like gods to you because... You had no fear, and whatever they told you, you believed it. You translate that to your eternal father. Children are, are an example of this. And you, you, know, you say, well, well, I'm older now, and I've seen things, and I know things, and I can't forget those things, and I'm not a child anymore. Well, God tells you, you've got to humble yourself. And so how do you humble yourself? You've got to give up your right to be right. And in order to do that, you've got to humble yourself. And, and in humbling yourself, you've got to trust. So it all comes down to trusting God. The fear, fear comes in when you don't trust God, right? You don't trust God to fill in the gaps. I said all that to, to say this, that, that it comes down to trusting God and, and that when you let go of, of, 
of some of those things that you don't have answers to and, and give it to God, that's, that's the right kind of fear you're supposed to have. Proverbs 1.7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. So when you start fearing the right thing and stop fearing the wrong things, you're going to get more and more confidence. So what does it look like when you do? When you start living fearlessly and fearing the right thing and not fearing the wrong thing? Uh, I think of Acts chapters 3 and 4. I'm going to kind of summarize it for you. Um, so leading up to Acts 4, 18-13, Peter and John uh, go up to the temple gate and, and they put this lame man at the steps of the temple so he can beg for money because it don't look good to have a lame guy begging for money on the steps. So most of the time people would give him money to get him out of there. So Peter and John go up to him and uh, when they go up to him, they ask him, and they, both of them say, look at us. We don't have silver and gold, but what we have to give you is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they touch him, and instantly he's healed. Keep in mind, this guy's 40 years old. This guy gets up and, and is jumping around, and I like to think he's probably hooping and hollering, and, and you know, he's causing a big fuss at the temple. Um, well, the more commotion he causes, some of the elders and leaders of the temple get, get word of this, and, and so they, they don't like it. So uh, by this time it's evening, and they, they put Peter and John in jail until the morning until they can be tried and, and talked to. And uh, so verse 8 is, is, is Peter's response to what, they t what the elders and, and scribes tell him that, you know, you know, why are you doing this? You don't, you don't need to be doing this. And so they kind of threatened Peter and John. And, and, and so this is Peter's response. In verse 8 it says, Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means was he healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by, his, by him, this man is standing before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to by which people we must be saved. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John, they realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, and they were amazed and recognized what they had been, that they had been with Jesus. If you notice that verse 13, they, were, they observed the boldness of Peter and John. See, Peter and John were walking in the Spirit. And they were walking in the Spirit so much that they were able to perform miracles. How many of you think you, that, that that can happen today? I think that when we all start walking in the Spirit like that, some really cool things are going to happen. The elders and scribes go on to threaten them and say, don't say anything about Jesus anymore. And Peter pretty much says, why wouldn't I say anything about Jesus or God? Do you think God would, how would God answer that question? Pretty much. And so they threaten them again. And they don't know what to do with them, so they just threaten them again. Well, Peter and John leave, and they go back to all the other disciples and followers, and uh, they tell them everything that happened. And uh, they start praying. And in Acts 4.29, it says, And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servants may speak your words with all boldness. If you notice, they didn't pray, Lord, Protect us from the leaders, or Lord, help us be wise in how we react to their threats. They prayed for boldness to speak more unashamedly and more fearlessly. That's what I'm talking about. When you give up your right to be right, and when you stop fearing the wrong things and start fearing the right thing, these things can happen. 
When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't have to worry about what to say. I didn't put this up there or give it to him to put up there, but Luke 12, 11 and 12 says, <coughs> whenever they bring you before synagogues and rulers and authorities, don't worry about how you should defend yourselves or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what must be said. I'm going to close with this. There's some people in this room today that need to be free like that, that need to be fearless like that. And uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I think of a song that's based on 2 Corinthians 3.17. And 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord there is freedom. And in that song it says, and I am free, amen. Some of you need to be free. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. And if you don't, then, then you need to know Jesus. Some of you want to get free, but don't know how, and, and, and that's just sin, and you, you need to confess it. And some of you are free, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm going to pray. Dear Lord, thank You for this time. Thank You for, for loving us. Thank You for Your Spirit. And thank You for giving us the freedom to be who You called us to be and help us just to, to always put our faith, hope, and trust in You and help us to always fear the right things. Uh, help us to to love you like you love us and and just help us to live fearlessly and boldly bold boldly uh, I just want to thank you for this time and all these people in this room and and I just pray that if there's somebody somebody in here that that doesn't know what I'm talking about that that they know who they know that you're speaking to them and and they know what they need to do and, and I pray that for for the people in here that, that need to break free that, that you'll just help them to see it and, and walk faithfully in it I love you in your name